Thanks to everybody who's showing up on such a beautiful um, April evening. I appreciate it and I hope you find uh, the next hour interesting. I'm calling from the East Burren, um, near a little village called Boston and Tubber, um, and it's a beautiful part of the world to be in uh, at the moment. So like Pranjali said, and thanks for the introduction Pranjali, I'm going to give you um, a 40 minute presentation. And I spent a lot of time preparing this, but um, I guess this, uh, it's, it's a strange format, uh, a webinar, but I hope you find it interesting. I've put a lot of thought and I guess effort into, into making it as interesting as possible. Um, just to start off with, here's a nice introductory image to the Burren, um, uh, a beautiful Park Nabinia wedge tomb with the summer flora in front of it. Uh, I work, as I said, with the Burren program. Uh, I'm also working with Bridget on farming for nature and with Prendley as part of the Burren Bio Trust. But I suppose in terms of who I am and why I'm here, I suppose, like most of my colleagues who, who are in all these organisations, what really motivates us and drives us is this wonderful biodiversity and cultural heritage that we have, not just in the Burren, but in all of Ireland. This is what really gets us going, I guess. Um, the biodiversity, um, the archaeology that you find right across the country, and of course, the farming that goes with it. So in terms of where I'm coming from with this talk, it's as somebody who just loves this heritage and wants to play their part in, in looking after it for future generations. Um, this is the Barron National Park. Tonight, I've broken my presentation into three parts because 40 minutes sounds like a long time. So I've tried to make the story um, as interesting and as relevant as I possibly can. So I'm going to start off with just a kind of review of some lessons learned from working with farmers uh, uh, since I first came to the Burren back in 1998. And I think it's relevant to a lot of people in the audience tonight because a lot of people are starting projects or in the early stages. So I think some of those learnings are quite useful. The second part of the presentation is about how we've applied those learnings in the Burren as part of the Burren programme. So the Burren programme, which I manage with, with a few of my colleagues, it's this really interesting and I suppose pioneering program whereby farmers are encouraged to manage the landscape in a way that enhances um, the local heritage and environment. Then thirdly, I'm going to sort of bring all those lessons together and look to the future as to you know, how we can encourage farming for nature, how we can encourage and mobilise farmers to, to, to look after the landscape as best as we possibly can. And really, it's about those farmers um, that I, I, I want to talk tonight. Um, you know, the barn might be unique, but the relationship between farmers and their land is universal. I think people have very close association with their land. And the challenge that I've had and the work I've been doing for the last 20 years with my colleagues is trying to find ways in which we can motivate these farmers to deliver for the environment and biodiversity. That's the really important thing. These farmers are hugely important. They're a part of our landscape and they're part of the future of the landscape as well. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is ways in which we can motivate farmers to improve our um, environment and our heritage in Ireland. So, um, here's where uh, we're looking at the west of Ireland. For those of you not from Ireland who don't know where the Burren is, we're here in the west coast of Ireland. Uh, it's what we call a high nature value farmed landscape because the extensive farming practices over thousands of years have created this wonderful mixture of biodiversity and habitat across the Burren. Now, most of my talks tonight will relate to high nature value farmed areas. Now, there's a 1 billion hectares of high nature value farmland in Ireland alone uplands, wetlands, along the west coast, etc. So the Burren is unique, but high nature valley farmland is right across our country. The Burren itself is about 72,000 hectares in size, about half of it is SAC, which means it's protected by European law. And within that area, we have about four to 500 farm families who manage that land. But as well as being high nature value, the Burren is really rich in cultural heritage, uh, and the two are deeply interwoven. Tim Robinson, the late great Tim Robinson, described the Burren as one vast memorial of the bygone cultures. There's just so much cultural heritage embedded in the landscape. To think of it, four and a half thousand years ago, this place, this image here, this landscape was densely settled and intensively farmed all those years ago. And the Burren bears that imprint of human activity going back 6,000 years. And it's, it's, it's such a fascinating and revealing part of the landscape that we can't ignore that either. So our mission, in the Burn program is conserving not just the habitats but also the cultural heritage and the communities that sustain them over the years over many many generations and this is a lovely landscape image of the Burn from our Wintridge um, walk last year which, which I'll return to in a little bit. So just to start off with um, the first section of the talk um, 
I arrived in Iran, luckily, I think, um, for me at least, uh, in around 1998 as a student. <clears throat> I was offered a PhD, um, a scholarship in the Burren, and that entailed two or three years on my knees looking at vegetation, about which, to be honest, I knew very little, and some would say I still don't know a whole lot. But my whole mission at the time was linking the vegetation with the management, so relating different forms of grazing management to different levels of vegetation and habitats. As well as that, I spent a lot of time interviewing farmers about their management activities and their association with the land and their opinion of their different schemes and so on and so forth. And of course, by living in the barn as I did through the course of the three years of the study, I got to know a lot of the people and I got my eyes were completely opened uh, to the landscape and how it functions. People like Paddy Healy here and in his wedge tomb. These, I learned more from these people than I learned from all of the books in UCD at the time. And I think that's something we often overlook in our landscape. And John O'Donoghue, um, the famous uh, Clare poet and priest, captured it very well. Uh, I remember reading this back when I was doing my PhD, that there's a world in the land, a farming world of the most sophisticated complexity and the most astute and rich memory that in the next 10 years will have vanished. Isn't there something wrong with either a way of life or a style of education that these huge ventricles of life, of memory and of perception are not being passed on? So I was really lucky to spend three years in the barn, um, learning from the people and recording some of their stories. And again, I'm reminded of Tim Robinson and his work in, in Connemara and the Arons and, and the barn as well. Just such a rich story uh, that it really um, is worth recording. So I could tell you a lot about the detail of the research, but really the findings were quite simple. Um, what we found through the research was that really in recent decades, since, since the mid 70s, the race and scale of change in farming has outstripped the barn's ability to adjust to it, resulting in a growing imbalance between farming and nature. I mean, when I grew up in the country, um, we were making cocks of hay, then it was bale, square bales, then round bales, then became silage pits, now there's round bales of silage. There's been so much change in such a short time, and the landscape um, hasn't really been able to respond. So if we look at the burn, what we find is that when the burn is over farmed or under farmed, this causes problems for the heritage. So for instance, if the farming intensity increases through land reclamation or fertilization or the feeding of silage, that causes big problems for biodiversity, for soil health, for water quality. And it obviously impinges on the heritage value of the burn. But equally, when we reduce farming levels in the burn, you get a lot of scrub encroachment, which can be good, but those cause a lot of uh, loss of biodiversity or change in biodiversity at least causes big problems for our cultural heritage as well this is the wedge tomb um, lost in the sea of scrub so what we want to do with our program this is what we've been trying to do for 20 years now is to kind of you know restore that balance between farmers and the landscape we want to keep farmers farming the barn but doing it in a way that enhances the heritage that's been our challenge now these issues are not unique to the barn um, these are same issues uh, faced by high nature value farmland right across Europe. And about 30 million hectares of land is similarly affected by either intensification or abandonment. And our habitats are really suffering as a result, as is our cultural heritage. Nor is this anything new. Uh, the pressure that farmers have exerted, has, have exerted on the burn over time, over 6,000 years, has always ebbed and flowed, and the landscape has always responded accordingly. But it's really the scale and the pace of the change which is significant at the moment and the consequences of that. So we need to do something about it. If we look at the landscape level at the barn, here it is in 1900, a photograph from the Lawrence collection, beautiful um, image. Look at the same landscape today and we can see how it's changed um, because of, I suppose, the withdrawal of farming from some of these areas. So obviously we needed to do something. Um, one response in the mid-1990s was to designate the burn as a special area of conservation. Now, that was a very important move, but it was just the first step. And unfortunately, it caused an awful lot of division between farmers and, I suppose, people interested in conservation. Because farmers felt that they weren't trusted, that their land and freedom to farm has been taken from them. So it caused a lot of negative um, outflow, I suppose. Then there was national agri-environmental schemes like REPS. But, um, I think farmers here found that REPS was very top-down and it didn't quite target the unique issues of the burn. And the research kind of confirmed all of this. Um, this is the final PhD study and it really called for a new tailored approach uh, for the burn with farmers at its heart. That's what the, 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 the research summarised, I suppose. But the research at the time was also very coloured by the fact that the number of farmers in the burn was reducing all of the time and 
according to this report in 2001, we're approaching a critical situation where the numbers available farmers to carry on the extensive practices may simply not be available. And that's continuing today. We're starting to lose um, a lot of our heritage because of the changes and the withdrawal of farming activity from these areas. So going back to the PhDs, a lot of these PhDs, um, such as my one, end up as coffee table books. And you can see the imprint of the coffee mug in this one, if you look carefully, or else uh, as doorstops um, and equally good use. But we were very lucky uh, in the burn that the story didn't end with the PhD study. And that's really thanks to people in Tagus, Michael McGrath, Tom Shannon, the CEOs, Claire at the time, who decided that this story needed to be told and was published in the form of a book called Farming in the Burn and launched by the minister at the time back in 2002, I think. And that was a hugely important event because farmers felt that they were getting their story back. The story which had been taken from them by the designations and by the academics had been given back to them. The other really good thing to happen at the time, good for me at least, was Anne O'Connor um, from Dublin appeared on the scene. Now Anne was back from London and when she heard the story, she thought this is an amazing story, we've got to tell it. Anne, who later became my wife and the mother of my children, um, was a, a social media expert at the time and she created this website called Burn Yo, the Living Burn, specifically to tell the world about the importance of farming, sustainable farming in this landscape. Now, Bermio has blossomed ever since through the work of many, many people um, uh, and a wonderful team to produce more information and to educate, I think, over 2,000 children in about the importance of their landscape. And the impact of that um, uh, initiative has been profound, really profound, I think. There's a lovely picture of these two kids here, and I was coming to tell them one day about the biodiversity of the barn and what have they done? They've gone out across the lawn and they've marked out the, the, the leaves of all these orchids, the early purple orchids in their, in their schoolyard. And I said, God, girls, that's amazing. You found this wonderful flower. You've, you've marked it off to show me. And they said, no, no, we didn't mark it to show you. We marked it so that the guy with the lawnmower wouldn't chop down all our amazing flowers. So that was the sort of the, the, the power of education and ownership by the local community. And I think the work of Baron Bio and of the book, the impact of that book was recognizing that farmers are very much part of this landscape and they're not apart from it. Now, to me, that was a very uh, important turning point because I think farmers felt now that they were part of the solution. And that allowed us to go forward um, as partners. Uh, the Burn IFA, led by the amazing man Michael Davron and his colleagues in Burn IFA, decided that, look, we're part of the solution here. So we're going to uh, row in behind uh, Tagusk, who commissioned the initial research. And by the MPWS, uh, who have been huge allies to this work over the last 15 um, years and have supported the projects for so long. The National Parks were convinced by the research and farmers were convinced by this, this, this new story to come on board as well. And we applied to Europe for funding for what's called the Burn Life Project in 2005. And our proposition to Europe was that we wanted to develop an evidence based blueprint for sustainable farming in the barn. And that was a very novel approach at the time because it was saying that, look, farming is part of the solution here. We got funding for five years and that funding was an amazing opportunity for us um, to, to come up with some solutions. Now we knew the problems, but what were the solutions? And it was a case of farmers and scientists working together to co-create solutions dealing with specific local problems. Um, and there's a lovely example here of the feeding of silage. So for farmers, this activity was necessary to make sure animal condition was maintained throughout the winter because the continental cross sucker a cow needed more nutrition than the barn could provide. But for the environmentalists, this was causing huge damage to soil, to the water, bringing in the weeds, leading to undergrazing and so on. But by working together, we developed um, a supplementary feeding system which eliminated most of the soil and water pollution which improved animal health and performance, and which was easier to feed the farmer um, to his cattle. So it really worked. It was validated by good science, and then it was demonstrated by the farmers, two other farmers, and that piece of research alone, um, I suppose, helped to almost eliminate one of the biggest problems in the burn over the period of the 80s and 90s, and that was the excess feeding of silage. But the problem hasn't gone away, but at least we have a lot of it um, um, shifted at this point, and there's a much better system in place. So by doing that for five years, by testing solutions on 20 farms and monitoring the impact, we were able to create this blueprint for how best to farm the barn in the future. And we did it in conjunction with the farmers. We listened, we learned, and they listened, and they learned. So after five years, we had verifiable proof that we could improve the condition status of the barn's habitats by what we're doing. 
And we also had a very high approval rating from the farmers. They liked this, this made sense. This wasn't just environmentalist stuff. This is real farming, put it in a smart way um, uh, that protected the environment. And ultimately we had a tested and a cost blueprint for farming the barn, which was supported by national parks, targets, everybody. Now the project went on to our amazement to win the best ever Life Nature Project in Europe in 2017, and that was over 25 years of funding, um, Life Nature Project. So it really enjoyed a lot of success on the international stage. But for us in the barn, it gave us greater understanding, greater trust between the farmers and the scientists and the authorities, a spirit of partnership and evidence with, with which we could go forward. So at that point, the Department of Agriculture came on board um, and gave us 1 million euros per annum for the next six years to scale this blueprint right across the barn, which is an amazing opportunity for us. And that's kind of the end of the first chapter of the story. And before I wanted to, before I move on to the second chapter, <clears throat> I just wanted to reflect a little, and I spent Easter holidays reflecting um, about the lessons learned. And I've, I've included eight lessons here, but I could easily include 80. But I just wanted to go through them briefly. One is the importance and the value of listening, really listening. I spent three years listening to farmers, and that was a wonderful privilege for me. But in terms of building trusts, understanding and knowledge, this listening is really important. And it's amazing how little we do of it sometimes. And I think part of the problem sometimes is that when we have people who consider themselves to be expert, I think then they start not to listen anymore. So it's, even for all of us who know or think we know something, we'll all, we'll all learn more by listening carefully. And that's one thing that stood to me, I think, over the years. Secondly, I think a lesson that I found important is sometimes when you meet a farmer, you think, why did he go and do that? And sometimes you have to stop yourself and you have to try and understand why people do things rather than immediately blaming them for doing them. By understanding why, then you can do something about changing. And I found that to be really important. Usually when I spoke to farmers about why they did something, they had very good rational explanations for me. And it was my challenge then to go present them with a better uh, argument as to why they shouldn't. Thirdly, I think um, the central and potentially positive role of farming and sustaining heritage, that really struck me at my time in the burn. When I saw that the importance of winter grazing for biodiversity in the burn, Immediately, the farmer, in my mind, didn't became, went from becoming a threat to a resource. Farmers are a resource sustaining our heritage. But unfortunately, as, as, as the years have shown, we haven't really harnessed this potential of farmers to improve our environmental outcomes. And that's um, down to a lot of reasons, which maybe I'll mention a little bit later as well. Another thing that really struck me, and I, I knew this coming from a farming background, but the depth and the strength of the connection between farmers and their land, their livestock, their community and their place cannot be underestimated. Farmers have a huge connection. Like here in the Burnley, we've got that great story of the farmer whose relative relation was found um, in a cave close to the, their, their current dwelling house and that, that, that skeleton had been there for 3,000 years. So we've got this incredible uh, temporal connection with the landscape as a farming community. And we have to respect that when we're talking about the conservation um, of the Burnley. I've also come to appreciate the importance of money. Farming is a business. Uh, we all work to make a living. Um, the importance of money in influencing decision making, why people do what they do. But I've also understood um, why uh, and, and how money isn't the only thing. But there's other motivations as to why people do what they do. And I think that's a really important uh, point to remember as well. Money isn't the only solution. I think as the PhD showed, um, it's really important to have evidence when you're designing these programs and these schemes. Um, when I finished the PhD, farmers' response was, so we knew that all the time. We've been saying that for years, but having it in a scientific format really um, enabled farmers' voice to be heard among the authorities uh, that matter at the time. Another point, I think, the power of partnership. We've been gifted with great leaders in national parks and targets in the Department of Ag um, in national monuments. We've been privileged to work with them. Uh, in a spirit of true partnership where we all benefit. And I think we've seen in the burn to our cost over the years, the disaster of a divided community and the pain that that can cause as well. So the power of partnership is, is, is something very important. And finally, I think uh, a point which is very close to my heart is that all farms are different. All farmers are different. Every farm is like the Republic. But this complexity is what makes our countryside special. Um, it's what nature loves, it's what, uh, it's what is wonderful about the Irish countryside, and we need to accommodate it. 
So getting people, trying to get people to do the same thing at the same time, the same way, is not a good idea. We should be embracing the diversity and the complexity of the landscape. So um, I'm going to move on now to maybe talk a little bit about uh, the Burn program. So this decade, uh, the past decade between 2010 and this year, where we've been rolling out our findings in the form of the Burn program um, and trying to improve the condition of the landscape uh, 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 as a consequence. So the Burn program began in 2010 and with three main objectives to sustain the high nature value of the burn, the habitat and the species, to look after the landscape and cultural heritage, and thirdly, to contribute to improvements in water quality and usage of water in the burn. Now, today, the program has 328 farmers farming about 23,000 hectares, probably some of the finest habitat in, in Europe. So I just want to tell you how we went about doing what we did, because it's, it's quite interesting, I think, pretty innovative as well. But before I do that, just to take a step back um, and to think about farming for a minute, and I think this is interesting. So for most people, and for farmers themselves, farmers are people who produce food. Um, it's mainly beef in the barn, weaning beef, uh, or it could be dairy, or it could be lamb, or it could be any number of, of, of food products. And I think this is what farmers understand their role to be in society. But in these high nature value areas especially, the farmers have also got the potential to generate what we call ecosystem services using their land and livestock. These include biodiversity, cultural heritage, water management, carbon storage, fire prevention, different things like that, which you kind of take for granted. So if you're a farmer, you're paid for one outcome, and that's your food. And often farmers, I think they feel they're forced to produce that food at the expense of other ecosystem services, or at least there's no reason why they shouldn't. Current program is that we also needed to put a value on these ecosystem services and say to the farmer, in the same way that you bring animal to the market and are paid for the quality of your animal, we think you should be paid for the quality of the ecosystem services that you deliver for society. Now, we're not talking about compensating you um, for being a farmer, we're talking about paying you for delivering services that society really wants. And we designed a program around that. So, in our program, farmers receive two types of payment. One is for delivering these ecosystem services. Biodiversity is a key one for us, uh, water quality as well, and cultural heritage. And to do that, it's really about day-to-day -day -day management, the grazing systems, the feeding systems, how you manage your land. But in order to deliver those ecosystem services, farmers need to invest in infrastructure. It could be repairing walls or capturing water or removing invasive species in order to enable the production of the services. So very simply, um, to come up with the payment for ecosystem services, um, here's what we did. Now, here's three very different scenarios in three different fields across the burn. Top left, over here, you'll see uh, very undergrazed, very poorly grazed land. White species poor, but not damaged in any way. Top right, you'll see uh, very intensively managed land, way more stock than the field can hold. A lot of soil damage um, uh, along here, a uh, lot of undergrazing and scrub encroachment in the background. Down here, then, you'll find a field with actually very well managed, uh, natural, naturally uh, stocked according to its capacity, water points well managed, and so on and so forth. And inherently, knowing the burn, uh, you can actually give a score of 10 for each one of those scenarios, even looking at the pictures. Zero out of 10, this is a disaster. Four out of 10, it's not great, it's quite poor, actually. Here, fantastic. Where are you going to get your ecosystem services? Down here. So, we feel that these two, you're not really producing much that we want to pay for. Whereas down here, you're producing a lot, and we're prepared to pay for that, up to 180 euros per hectare. So that makes total sense. Um, the more we produce, the more you get. But how do you make that um, into a scientifically um, robust scoring system? Well, I can thank my colleagues for that, uh, in particular Dr. Dr. Sharon Parr, who designed this really fantastic scoring system for the Borough. And really, it's very simple. The key design principle was that we had to make it in a way that farmers could completely understand the score and where it was coming from and how it was arrived at, and how it could be improved. So we used indicators which would be familiar to the farmer uh, in the burn, like the grazing level, was it too high or too low? Is much dead plant material, which is indicated for grazing? Was there much damage around the feed point? Is the soil in good health? What do natural water sources look like? So those relate to current management of, of 
also looked at um, um, criteria relating to existing and emerging problems like um, scrub encroachment, millennia encroachment, weed. These are all going to limit the, 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 the quality of the field. Something called ecological integrity. Does this field look like it should do if it were in good condition? Now, those 10 indicators are captured in the form of a simple worksheet. So a farm advisor will go out every summer to one of 1,700 fields in the burn and do a rapid assessment of these various indicators. Each one will get a score. So here, the grazing is considered to be nine out of uh, a score of nine. If it's too low, we get minus 35, too high, it'd be minus 36, and so on down through the criteria. When you tally all those criteria up, you get a score of 10. This comes out at an eight out of 10. Now, this assessment can be done very quickly. 30 minutes or an hour is usually sufficient to do a field, um, a vintage field in the burn. And the better the score, the better the payment. And you can see from the chart here what we pay. So eight out of 10 means 96 euros per hectare. So if you've got a 10 hectare field, you're gonna get 960 euros. Now, if you've got a 10 out of 10, you're gonna get 1,800 euros, which is a really good price. However, if you score up to five out of 10, we're gonna give you nothing because you're not delivering enough. We think you're not delivering enough to warrant the payment. But from five up, you get a little bit more and more and more, and up around nine and 10, you get a bonus payment. And again, it's like, bringing your animal to the market, the really pedigree, high quality animal will get a premium payment and the good quality animal will get a good payment, but a poor quality animal you're bringing back home again. So we pay nothing for less than five, uh, bonus for eight and nines, uh, nines and tens rather. And then for rare habitats like these lowland grasslands, we pay a higher rate per hectare. So these are meadow grasslands, which we do ecological assessments to determine the quality of them. And they're paid at a higher rate. So this might sound a little bit complicated, but to the farmer, it's very simple because every year we give the farmer a one page sheet outlining each field. You can see, for instance, here, field two. Um, each field, this all fits in one sheet of paper. We give a management recommendation about how best to manage the field. We show the area of the field, the score out of 10, the payment rate, and the payment that the farmer will receive for that field. Now, the payments or the, the, the scores will change year on year because it's done every year, and the payments will change. But we can track the average score per year per farm and the average payment per year. And we can actually track these scores, obviously at a fee level, but also at a farm level and at a program level to monitor how good a job the farmer is doing and how good a job the program is doing. The total payment, the maximum payment the farmer can get from this measure is 10 grand per annum if he's got a lot of land in really good condition. Now, the average payment is about 2,500 euros, 2,600 euros. But that's it, that printout is what the farmer receives every year. Each one of our 320 farmers receives this, print, receives this printout, alerting him or her to the amount of money that they've earned from, from good environmental management. Now, if the score is very low, the farmer can apply to a fund to do some work to improve the score. So here in this case, the farmer has decided, I want to do some scrub control. Now, we never tell the farmer what to do. We allow the farmer to decide what he or she feels needs to be done, and then supply some funding to do that but mostly farmers choose actions designed to improve their field score and their payments. So this farmer has to remove scrub. We'll give him a price for that job, mark it on a map. The farmer can cut the scrub or get a contractor to do it. And by doing that, hopefully he'll improve the score of the field. Every job we price, we know farmers hate paperwork. So rather than asking for receipts, every job has a unit price, whether it be cutting scrub or fitting, fitting a gate or putting a water trough in. We also help the farmer to get permissions because if you're working in the barn, you need permission from national monuments, national parks, the local authority to do work. And we help the farmer to secure all those permissions. And just to reflect the type of work the farmers do, um, a lot of wall repair, a lot of scrub removal, it's a big issue in the barn, often by machine, but sometimes by hand because we've got so much archeology. span uh, In many cases, you're only allowed to remove it by hand as the case around this wedge tool. A lot of work on improving water quality. So, if you've got a polluted well, which isn't being managed well, that's going to cost you a couple of scores in your payment um, uh, structure. So by investing in water harvesting, as you can see here, or water storage or pasture pumps, the farmer can provide clean water to his animal and improve his field score for any annual payment. So again, farmers choose these works in order to improve their field score and their payment. A lot of work on opening paths through scrub for cattle. You can see it here and here putting in access tracks, but doing it in a way that minimizes damage to the environment. 
your stalling gates like this beautiful um, burn made gate that you see in the picture. Simple jobs, but jobs which make the burn more um, farmable, if you like, and can improve the environmental management of the region. And by doing those works, and most importantly by restoring grazing, and horses we find are particularly good at restoring land which hasn't been grazed in a good few years. But by putting the cattle and the livestock back, you can actually create this really good quality species rich habitat. Now this site in the image here, which looked wonderfully species rich, a few years before it looked like this, it was a feeding site. But the farmer, through the program, moved from silage feeding to feeding ration, tidied up the walls, the watering points, did a lot of work and produced this. And this is an additional product. It's not an alternative product. We want the farmer to continue to produce beef. It's an additional product and we can guarantee its price for five years. And if you're a beef farmer, and you know what a crisis there is for beef farmers at the moment, having a guaranteed price for the next five years is significant. So that's how it work, uh, works. This field went from scoring zero to scoring 10. It went from zero euros per hectare to 180 euros per hectare. Uh, and that's quite a large field, so it was well worth the farmer's while. So just to finish off on this section, what has the impact of the work been? Well, I told you before, we can actually track the environmental health score of, the, of each field and each farm and the whole program over time. And when we started, the average score across the barn was 6.8 out of 10. And every year, it's gradually shifted um, and improved bar a transition year 2015 when we were changing the um, um, program. And today it stands at about 7.6. How that's happened, if you look at this graph here, is that the area of the barn scoring 8, 9 and 10, which is really good quality, the management is superb in these areas, has increased at the expense of the poorer scoring areas. So we've got tons of data showing that this program really does deliver for the environment. And that's important because this is tax, taxpayers' money that we're spending here. We've also got a lot of data on work that's been completed. So you can see here, there's been 205 kilometers of pathways opened up through scrub in order to enable grazing to happen. 127,000 meters of stone wall have been repaired. 850 gates has, have been installed, 530 water troughs. All of this conservation infrastructure has been completed over the last 10 years. Now, this isn't a giveaway. Farmers earn what they get from this program. And in fact, all the work that we fund is co-funded by the farmers. And um, most farmers, uh, out of our farmers, not all of them even apply for work. Only 60% have drawn down money to do the work because it's not easy work. Not everybody wants to do it. So every penny that's spent is, is fully accounted for. The economic impact of the program, which is really important uh, in a, an isolated rural area. There's been about 9.2 million euros paid to farmers since this program started, with an additional 2 million co-funding from farmers. The average payment isn't huge. It's close to about 6,000 euros, but this sits on top of GLOSS, our national payment. So most farmers currently would receive an average maybe 10,000 to up to 10,000 a year in environmental payments uh, in the burn. About 6 billion has been paid for the results part. This is down to management. To produce the result, you've got to put a lot of legwork in to graze the land out properly and to make sure the feeding system is appropriate. So that's been hard earned. Uh, about five and a half million of work, the worth of work has been done by local farmers and contractors. Uh, there's been a lot of additional business for local suppliers, including um, Howley's and Kilfenora, who make these beautiful barn gates, along with a few other suppliers in the region. A good few farmers have started doing farm tourism now because they've got a great story to tell and the confidence to tell it. And economically as well, we've got an office, all of our staff, we've got six staff, most of them are locally based, um, most of our advisors, farm advisors are locally based as well, so that's bringing money into the local economy, local economy as well. And finally, the social impact I think is very significant. We have training days every year with our farmers, and through the work of the Barnbury Trust, we have monthly talks, uh, and this is, this is the webinar version of monthly talk, but monthly talks and walks, and the walks you're often led by a farmer. Here's a couple of work showing farm people his land. And I'd, I'd just suggest to people who are watching this from different parts of Ireland and Europe that these ideas are so simply executed and they're so powerful as innovations that I'd really encourage people to look at it. Try and organize maybe six walks a year with local farmers. You've got so much to tell and show off to the land. For the farmer, it's a hugely empowering experience showing the public his land. And for the public, it's a really important insight into the value that farmers deliver for society when they do the right thing uh, for the environment. And through Burn Bio as well, we've organized an annual farming festival called the Burn Winter Weekend, which is our window to the world when we tell everybody the importance of the farming. 
in these highly developed areas. They're not the most productive areas in the world in terms of food production, but in terms of um, ecosystem services, they're immense. And we want to highlight that, 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 that role that they play. So that's it. And we can track the, the, the data. We can track the change. This is in 2017. And you can see over time, new farms coming on board, scores shifting gradually more positive over time. So we're very pleased and we're very grateful to the farmers for the positive impact that the program has had over the last 10 years. Now I'm going to finish off. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good on time. I'm going to finish off uh, and just talk about the broader relevance, because I know there's a lot of people listening tonight thinking, well, that's the burn. So what? It's interesting. but So what? What relevance does that have for me? And I think it's important um, to recognize that the story I've just told is relevant, I think, right across Ireland and right across Europe. Not least because right now we have a climate and biodiversity crisis uh, in Europe. I'm acutely conscious of, of, of the COVID crisis as well when I say this, but we still do have a huge climate and biodiversity crisis to deal with. Um, and this is in spite of billions of Europe of European investment, EU investment, largely through the CAP. Unfortunately, in spite of that investment, a lot of our farmland indicators for biodiversity are going down all the time. Um, there's a very negative story on climate as well. So it's not good and we need to do something about it. And I think we need to view farmers in a different way in the future, not just as food producers, which is critically important, but also as almost like first responders to these climate and biodiversity crises. I think we've got amazing farmers across Ireland, across Europe, who have a huge role to play in addressing um, these problems. I was in Spain last year and I met this man, Edu Balcells, and Edu is an amazing guy. He's got his herd of sheep, uh, but he's doing something interesting with those sheep in Catalonia. Um, there's less and less farming on the hills, um, there's more and more tourism, and there's hotter and hotter summers. And those three factors together mean that there's a lot more fires, and those fires cost hundreds of millions every year, every year to fight. But Edu is paid by the government in Catalonia to manage sheep to graze fire breaks. In other words, to reduce the fire load and to reduce the risk of fire. And he does that at a tiny fraction of the cost of fighting these fires uh, and, and with a lot less danger to human life. And he's one of potentially hundreds of thousands of farmers, if not millions across Europe, who have a role to play in delivering ecosystem services, adapting to climate, mitigating against climate change, supporting biodiversity and so on. And I think we really need to mobilize these farmers urgently. So the last few slides, I just talk about how we might do that or some ideas as to how we might do it. So my whole thesis is that we can consider the, right, the wrong type of farming has been very destructive and that story is well versed. I think we know the damage that the wrong type of farming can do to biodiversity, to climate, water quality, to soil health and so on. But I think there's another story to be told as well and I think the positive story is an important one. So I like to see farmers as a conservation resource and I think to do that, to exploit that resource, I think we need to design programs to support them that are much more appealing to farmers' value systems. So by which I mean, if we can localize our environmental programs, make them practical and relevant to the farmer, then they're much more effective. And that's a big reason why barn farmers really buy into the program, because it makes sense to them and to their farming system. Secondly, when we pay farmers, it's not just about the amount of money, it's about how fair the payment is and how transparent it is. I think that's why I'm a great advocate for paying farmers for delivering environmental outcomes, not just for actions, that's important too, but also for outcomes. Thirdly, I think we need to design schemes which are flexible. This is really important to farmers. They don't like being told what to do, but set them a target and challenge them to deliver that target and they love it. They're very innovative and they will produce some really amazing outcomes. But they have to be allowed to do that in a way that accommodates weather, disease and local conditions. Another really important thing, when I started in this project, we had reps plans and they look like telephone directories. They're incredibly difficult to interpret. So we totally revolutionized that by having a simple one page farm plan. And I think that's so important. Simple farm plans, minimizing receipt requirements, helping the farmer to get permission to do the work so that the farmer can get on with what the farmer does best, which is farming. I also think it's important that we're more positive. Conservation tends to be quite negative about restricting negative activity, whereas I think we need to be promoting positive activity. And we also need to be more inclusive of the farmer's input and the farmer's voice. And finally, I think we need to have more continuity. 
farmers will not invest in environmental management unless they believe there's a future in it. And we have to have long-term funding and support for these farmers. And in the burn, we've managed to tick a lot of these boxes. And as a result, our farmers are heavily invested in their program and it's, it's success. There's something that's been foisted upon them. It's their program and they're determined to make it succeed. So just I wanted to highlight a couple of things from that. The local aspect, payment for results, and this notion of inclusivity. There's a book about to be published, which I'd really get into, um, edited by Eileen O'Rourke and John Finn, which looks at these result-based payment structures across Ireland, how they work, and how they might be part of the future. But for me, they're critical. I think they're a real game changer, because they provide the farmer with an incentive uh, so every year the farmer can earn more money potentially, which is really important. Huge flexibility. We never tell the farmer what to do. We pay him for what he delivers. Really good value for money because if the farmer doesn't deliver, then we're not going to pay. Really good in terms of awareness that farmers understand what it is has to do and can, can recognize what, what habitats or features they're needed to, uh, to produce through their activities. And also, as we've shown before, these result-based approaches deliver really good real-time monitoring of the impact of programs. So I think they should really be a big part of our future in the environment in Ireland. From the farmer's perspective, we've interviewed farmers about this. Do they think the system is fair? 83% say yes, it is. And we've seen the same finding in other projects like the Freshwater Pearl Muscle Project in, in, in Kerry. Farmers think this is a fair system. Why? Well, because you get paid for what you do and you don't get penalised in what you don't. The more work you do, the more money you get. It rewards efforts and you're paid to improve your land and more importantly, your life and family. So these are um, all words from the, uh, the barn farmers as to why they like this approach. I find um, that you know, this result-based payment system that we pioneered, I guess, to some degree in the barn, even though there's other projects across Europe which do it as well, it enables ongoing monitoring, it offers farmers flexibility, guarantees you the taxpayer value for money, and it doesn't necessarily need to be complex or expensive to run. For instance, when we allocate for every 100 euros we allocate under this measure, we, it costs us eight euros to administer that, and that includes the monitor. So there's been a lot of good work done on this through the likes of James Bourne and some other colleagues around Ireland on result-based environmental schemes, scorecard, different types of habitats. So the science is there, uh, the need is there, we just need to get going and make it happen. The second point I wanted to emphasize is the power of the local. Um, Eileen O'Rourke, who I mentioned before, had a great quote back from a piece of research I did in the Burn 2001, that the majority of local people don't have a sense of ownership of their heritage. They feel that it's been imposed upon them and from outside. But in the Burn and uh, some other projects, the research and the design have been done locally involving farmers. This is our office right in the heart of the Burn. If the farmer's got a problem, he comes to me and I'll help him sort out that problem. And that's hugely important. If the farmer needs advice, he'll come and get advice right there. And we have a local management committee consisting of the farmers, farm advisors, and the public authorities as well. And I'm really proud, I guess, of the fact that it, our Department of Agriculture, and with help from National Parks and others, have, uh, has replicated this local model across Ireland through EIP Agri. Now, a lot of you tonight might be part of these projects, and I think, I think there's about 23 in Ireland. But this is where farmers and scientists come together at a local level and make a plan to improve their local environment. And these, I think, are phenomenally great projects uh, because uh, they capture that enthusiasm um, and innovation at a local level. And there's a few I'd like to single out, the Pearl Muscle Project, uh, the Bride Project, uh, Hen Harrier Project, Craven Aaron. These are really innovative projects uh, which are making a big change because this local approach, it allows better buy-in, more relevant actions, and a better ability to address and resolve issues appropriately. Uh, I'd also like to point out the fact that a lot of these in purple here, um, this is James chart, I think, are locally based EIPs which are using a result-based approach to their payments. So they're paying for actions, but also for outcomes. That's really important. And the third point I just wanted to emphasize um, was to be more inclusive. Um, I love this quote from Spark News. Um, to change the world, let's start changing the way we talk about it. And let's highlight those initiatives that are having a positive impact on people and on the planet to renew our confidence and spur us into action. I've been privileged to work with farmers in the burn for 20 years, and I think they're great people. I think they're amazing people, and some of them do amazing work that's rarely heralded. But I think those farmers ex exist right across Ireland. So a few years ago, a few of us, um, Michael Davern, James, Bridget Barry, and myself, set up a little project called Farming for Nature. And its purpose was to identify and celebrate those farmers across Ireland who day-to-day 
are looking after the land in a way that enhances the cultural and natural value of that land. And these people are extraordinary. You'll hear from one of them next week, a guy called Dolan Sheehan down in Cork, who is a wonderful man. And I'd really encourage you to go visit the Farm for Nature website and view videos from Donal and from about 25 other ambassadors across Ireland who are the most amazingly wonderful, eloquent and passionate and practical speakers about farming and nature that you'll have. But what we've come to recognise um, uh, in Farming for Nature, and I'd, 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 I'd not I'd give Bridget Barry here a nod on this, who's doing huge work coordinating the project, is the value of the knowledge, the practical knowledge that these farmers have have about managing habitats. They can answer questions that I as a scientist could never answer at all. So every year we bring these farmers together, we celebrate them, we give them an award, we make them ambassadors, we organize farm walks where those farmers can share their knowledge with other farmers and the power of the peer learning, especially for the farmers, is very important. I often think working with farmers, the messenger is almost as important as the message. So with Farming for Nature and our ambassadors, it's farmers uh, teaching other farmers about how to manage your land for nature. So that's a wonderful initiative and if you know farmers across Ireland who are worthy of this nomination uh, and becoming an ambassador, please let us know uh, at Farm Nature. So in summary, um, my question starting off tonight was how do we motivate more farmers to deliver more of these ecosystem services that we badly need in Europe? And reflecting across what I've been speaking about for the last 30 minutes, 35 minutes, I think it boils down to three things. The pocket. Farming is a business. We need to make a better proposition to farmers. We need to pay them for the delivery of these ecosystem services. That's clear. I think that's really clear. And we've got really good examples now across Ireland about how that can be done. Secondly, how do you do it? So if you're a beef farmer or dairy farmer, you've got access to really good chagask advice and so on and so forth. But if you want to farm for nature, where do you go? How do you get your information? We need to provide technical support and innovation and research and advice as to how you do that. And again, there's some really good European projects like HNB Link, um, Farm for Nature has great resources about that, and some of these EIP agri projects have great new resources as well. And finally, in my experience, there's, there's something else. Uh, we have 320 farmers, some of them are phenomenal, and I think those phenomenal ones have one thing in common. The heart is in this work. They feel that this is important work, this is work that, work that is really worth doing. Philomena Hines in the picture is a great example of that. An extraordinary woman who loves the burn, loves her place, called me last week telling me she's seen her first gentian. Uh, it's these people and their heart. So if we can convince as many farmers as possible that farming for nature is a valid, it's worth doing and it's part of their future, then I think we're really winning. And again, the work of Burn Your Trust in connecting people with their place, the Burn, burn Winter Weekend and Farming for Nature are terrific resources in that regard. So if you want farmers to farm for nature we must provide them with more compelling proposition that's what an offer right what's on offer right now so think of it pocket the head and heart so bring it all together um where do we go from here um well we're all busy running programs in the barn but we're always happy to share our story if anybody's got any questions but i think i think we all need to collectively to advocate for more payments for results through our new cap so if we can direct more of our CAP payments to farmers who are actually delivering for nature, I think that will create an appetite for more farmers to deliver for nature. So I think there's a political thing uh, here that we need to be very conscious of. Secondly, I think these locally led or locally adapted programs where farmers come together with scientists to address local and regional issues, I think it's a hugely powerful model. And I think we need more and more of those projects in Ireland and right across Europe. We need to share the findings of those projects to convince others to, to, to follow suit. And the third thing I think is we need to build a network of support for farmers who want to farm for nature, where we share knowledge and enthusiasm in some of the stories. And I think if we can do that, we'll be really uh, winning. And we've got a lot of good partners across here at the moment. I wanted to leave you with this image um, in the finish, uh, and this kind of brings it all together for me. Uh, this is from our cattle drove last year, where every year, a wooden barn farm family brings their cattle back onto the winter to another season. And it's a great um, occasion to celebrate the importance of high nature value farming and farming for nature. Uh, this year, we selected Aoife Ford in the picture here uh, to lead her cattle, a young, well-educated, highly eloquent uh, female farmer who's bringing her cattle up onto the barn uh, for another season, reenacting a tradition that goes back thousands of years. The field that she's bringing scores a 10 out of 10. Um, I hope that's no secret, but it's superbly managed through Aoife and her family. And she's being rewarded, not just for the quality animals that you see here, but also for her biodiversity. But best of all, Aoife was one of her early graduates from uh, the Off the O programme, 
uh, started by Burnham Yo back in 2002. So that shows you the power of education and how you know it's 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 come full circle at this point. But that was a very proud moment for us all in Burnham Yo and I think in the Burn as well. So fair play, fair play to you, Aoife, and your family as well. So that's it for me. I'll leave you an image of the gentian, which has reappeared in the burn over the last two weeks. I'd like to thank you for your attention, those that hung on uh, through this presentation. If you want more information, there's lots of resources here, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for the various projects uh, who have been really good to us over the years. So I'm going to finish with that and hand across to Pranjali, I think, who hopefully has a few questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. That was a that was a wonderful presentation, and uh, thank you to all our attendees uh, for their participation today and for sending us. Really, there's there's good few questions there for you. Uh, I think we'll take just a few since we don't have time. Apologies in advance to them uh, uh, if we are, aren't addressing your questions. Please email them to us at info at .com and we'll try our best to um, to respond to them. So the first question, Brendan, is um, there is no debate that there is a fan this is a fantastic project. However, how sustainable is this scheme long term? It will always be reliant on outset payments. Have you any worries about long term funding for this project? This is the first part of the question. And the next part okay. is, has there been any work to try and create a field to fork initiative marked on its high environmental credentials? This would then create a more sustainable farming system long term. What's, what's the second thing, Brantley? Uh, what's the uh, second bit is, has there been, been any work done to try and create a, a field to fork initiative to make okay. it more sustainable? Yeah. Yes, a good question. So firstly, um, I think what burn farmers are producing are public goods and services, which currently are being paid for by public funding. Now, the burn program does it much more efficiently and effectively than most of its competitors. So I think the future for the burn program is very positive. I think there is money in the kitty at a European level. The problem is that money hasn't delivered enough in terms of agri-environmental outcome. So I think the work of the Burn program and the other EIPs that I highlighted before, I think that's going to become more and more relevant in the future because it delivers. It delivers in a way that engages farmers and uh, gives good value for money and improves the environment. And we can prove that. But the second part of that, I think, which is interesting, is that I think this result-based approach lends itself very well, very well to private sector investment. So there's an opportunity to supplement the public funds, which are sufficient at the moment, with private sector funding in the future. And we're exploring that all the time. Farm to Fork, a colleague of mine, Rory Kravur, put an awful lot of work years ago into a burn beef and lamb producer group. Um, and it didn't fully succeed. We learned a lot from it. It was really important. Um, but at the time, it didn't fully succeed. I think at the moment, there's a lot of interest among farmers in revisiting that idea, um, because now we've more farmers on board there's more awareness of the burn and the value of uh, the, the, the service being provided and the quality of the meat as well, of course. And I think maybe with this current crisis, it might be an opportunity to promote local food a little bit more strongly. So we're, we're going to look at that again, hopefully, in, in the coming years. Okay, Brendan, your next question. If you were to look into a crystal ball, what would you like to see both in the burn and nationally for the future of farming in 25 years? I, I, I'd be very enthusiastic about the future for Irish farming in particular because I think we have this green image in Ireland now. People talk about origin green and it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's limitations. But I think or we have done a phenomenal job in building a brand. The challenge now is to live up to that brand. I think we can produce food, um, high quality food in a very sustainable way and a way that can actually enhance and, 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 and enrich our natural and cultural heritage. Uh, that can provide better nutritional outcomes for people. And it can be affordable. I do think food is too cheap, but I think we can afford to pay more for food that's of higher nutritional value that respects the environment. And I think the future for Irish farming is um, not in quantity, it's in quality. And when I talk about quality, it's in terms of the products produced, but also the services, those ecosystem services produced. So I think there's a bright future. I think um, I can't quite see how we arrive at it, but I think the burn and some of the other EIPs provide really important stepping stones toward that future. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, well, listen, we just, um, there's, there's a few questions, but um, I think Pranjali and I decided that uh, perhaps it's better if they were emailed, but there's quite a lot of questions, so we'll be able to email the people. Um, or e And if you have any further questions, 
uh, to email info at burnbio.com or um, info at farmingfornature.ie and we'll be able to get these uh, questions to Brendan. Um, Brendan, uh, on behalf of Farming for Nature, um, I'd just like to thank you for kickstarting this series and also to Pranjali for co-hosting, um, um, Baron Bio for co-hosting it. So this series will be going on, as Pranjali said at the beginning, for the next uh, six weeks. We'll have a speaker every night, uh, every Wednesday night um, at 8 p.m. So you just have to register through either burnbio.com um, or uh, on the homepage of farmingfornature.ie. And uh, next week, we have, uh, Brendan mentioned him earlier, um, we have Farming for Nature Ambassador Donald Sheehan speaking, and he's also the instigator and project manager behind the Bride Project. Um, he's a dairy farmer down in County Cork, and he is speaking about improving biodiversity on farmland. And as he says himself, where there's a will, there's a way. So do join us for that. Um, you have to register beforehand, but um, as I said, you can register on burnbio.com. Um, meanwhile, thanks for joining us tonight and um, have a good week and stay safe. And thanks, Brendan, and thanks, Burn Bio Trust, and thanks to all our participants. Thank you.